So far, we've really only focused on unconstrained optimization problems. In an unconstrained case, we know what to do. We just need to find any point where the gradient or subgradient is equal to zero. And all the algorithms we've really looked at are basically just different strategies to find such a point. But when we add constraints, things get a little bit more complicated. So, so in particular, we may not be able to find any points inside of the constraint set where the gradient is actually equal to zero. And so showing that we've actually found an optimal point is a little bit more complicated. In this lecture, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to how we think about constrained optimization. And we're going to look at problems of the form where we're going to try to minimize over all x and rn, f of x. And then we're going to add constraints that look like some function gm of x is less than or equal to zero, where m ranges from 1 to capital M. So we have up to m different constraints. And here we're always imposing just for simplicity, for notational consistency, that these constraints are inequality constraints saying that some function of x is less than or equal to zero. We can always write any inequality constraint to look like this, and we could also handle equality constraints, but for the purpose of this lecture, it's gonna be much cleaner if we just look at inequality constraints. Now, just like before, we're gonna mostly focus on the case where f of x is convex. And now that we have constraints, we're also gonna be restricting ourselves to the case where these constraints are also convex functions. Finally, an important consideration that we are going to need to worry about now that we're talking about constrained optimization problems is the idea of feasibility. So it's very easy to actually write down an optimization problem where we specify a bunch of desirable constraints, but it's not a given that actually there's any x that satisfies all these constraints. So we say that x is feasible if it satisfies all of these constraints. And we say that an optimization problem is feasible if there's at least some x that satisfies all of these constraints. For our purposes, we're always going to assume that this is the case, but it's not always a given. Okay, so the big idea in constrained optimization is going to be this idea of the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian basically just takes the constraints in this problem and incorporates them into the objective function. So specifically, we write the Lagrangian as a function L of x and another vector lambda, which is given by f of x plus the sum from m equals 1 to m of lambda m gm of x. And these lambda m's are just real numbers that multiply each of the constraints. So lambda is a vector in Rm. For reasons that will become clear later on, we'll call these variables x the primal variables, and lambda as either the dual variables or Lagrange multipliers. And what the Lagrangian does is it allows us to transform the constrained optimization problem we were looking at before into an unconstrained problem, where we just try to minimize the Lagrangian with respect to x for some fixed lambda. Now, to get some intuition, suppose that we set these lambda m's to be very large positive numbers. And in this case, if we violate any of these constraints, so we let gm of x be greater than zero, then this will result in adding a penalty that could be very large if we set these lambdas to be large. And if we set lambda m big enough, it'll guarantee that the resulting solution will satisfy this constraint. But the problem is that large values of lambda m also actually encourage gm of x to be much smaller than zero, since we can potentially benefit it by not just satisfying the constraint, but sort of exceeding this constraint and making gm of x very negative. This raises a natural question, which I don't think has an immediately obvious answer, which is that, well, is there some value of lambda that would actually make the solution to this unconstrained problem the same as our original constrained problem? Well, it turns out the answer is yes. And here we're going to describe what this answer looks like in the case where the objective function f and the constraints are not only convex, but are also differentiable. So suppose x star is a solution to our original constrained problem. Now, if we want x star to be a solution to our unconstrained problem, so then basically what we need is for the gradient with respect to x of the Lagrangian evaluated at x star to be equal to zero. Now, if we already knew such an x star, then finding a lambda that would make the unconstrained and constrained problem equivalent would just amount to finding a lambda that satisfies this equation. But unfortunately, this is not too helpful since 
X star is what we're actually trying to find here to begin with. However, finding such a lambda is possible. To see how we're going to do it, though, we're going to have to have a brief detour to talk a little bit more about this idea of duality. So if we think back to our unconstrained optimization problem, we can actually think of this as representing a family of different optimization problems that depend on lambda. So for any lambda, we could solve this constrained optimization problem and compute the minimum value of the objective function and think of this as actually defining a function that maps lambda to some real number. And we call this the Lagrange dual function and we'll denote it by D of lambda. We're not gonna show this here, but using a result from a previous homework, it's relatively straightforward to show that D of lambda is going to be a concave function. Now, one useful fact about the dual function is that it actually gives us a lower bound on the optimal value of the original problem. Now, in the discussion below, we're going to assume that all of the lambda m are greater than or equal to zero, but otherwise they could be arbitrary. In this case, it is not hard to show that d of lambda is less than or equal to f star. So just take any feasible point x prime. If x prime is feasible, then we must have gm of x prime is less than or equal to zero for all m. And that's the sum of lambda m gm of x prime, as long as lambda m is positive, is less than or equal to zero. And this immediately tells us that the Lagrangian evaluated x prime and lambda has to be less than the objective function f evaluated x prime for any possible x prime and lambda. Now, since the dual function d of lambda is just the minimum of the Lagrangian over all possible x, that's certainly going to be less than or equal to the Lagrangian evaluated at some x prime that may or may not be the x that minimizes the Lagrangian. And we've just shown that's less than or equal to f of x prime. And since this holds for any possible x prime, including the x star that gives us the optimal value for our original objective function f star, we've shown that this has to be less than or equal to f star. Okay, now given that d of lambda gives us a lower bound on f star, if you wanted to get some idea of what f star looks like, so for example, to see if you are close to convergence in some algorithm, you'd like to know how small could f star be? Well, then it's natural to say, well, we have this lower bound that's given by d of lambda. We'll actually have many lower bounds depending on lambda. And we'd like to know how big can this lower bound be? And this gives rise to what we call the dual problem of our original optimization problem, which is to say, well, we form this dual function d of lambda, and then we say, let's maximize with respect to lambda and rm, d of lambda subject to the constraint that lambda is greater than or equal to zero. Because the way we've incorporated our constraints gm into the dual function, these lambda only really make sense when lambda is greater than or equal to zero. So how large can we make this lower bound? Well, we'll just denote that by d star. That's the optimal value of this optimization problem. Now, since d of lambda is always less than or equal to f star, that's true for any lambda. So it's gonna be true for the lambda that maximizes the dual function. So that tells us that d star is always less than or equal to f. And if we look at f star minus d star, this is gonna be some non-negative number. And it's what's called the duality gap. And it's telling us how far apart are the solutions to the original primal optimization problem and the dual optimization problem. Sometimes F star is actually equal to D star. And when that happens, what we say is that we have strong duality. And we'll discuss in a minute some examples where strong duality holds. But first, I want to say, why is this important? Well, Suppose that x star is the solution to our original primal problem and that lambda star is the solution to our dual problem. So it turns out that if we have strong duality, then lambda star is exactly what we need to ensure that x star is the solution to the unconstrained problem. So to see why this is the case, note that if we have strong duality, then f of x star has to be equal to d of lambda star. Remember, what is d of lambda star? Well, it's just the solution to this minimization problem where we minimize over x and rn. The Lagrangian, which is f of x plus the sum of lambda m star gm of x. This quantity is the smallest we could ever make the Lagrangian function for any x. So that has to be less than or equal to the Lagrangian function evaluated at any particular x, such as x star. So we get that this is less than or equal to f of x star plus the sum of lambda m star gm of x star. But now note that x star 
is the solution to our original optimization problem. So it has to be feasible. So gm of x star must be negative. Lambda m star has to be positive. And so this whole quantity has to be less than or equal to zero. And that means this is less than or equal to f of x star. But now if we look at this entire chain of inequalities where the first term is f of x star and the last term of that is f of x star, this basically tells us that actually these inequalities have to be equalities. That's the only way this could be true. And if we look here in the middle, what this equality means is that x star is actually the minimizer of the Lagrangian function when we're using lambda star as our dual variable. Okay, so when does strong duality hold? Well, the answer here is pretty complicated. It depends a lot on the structure of the constraints, and we're not really going to delve too deeply into this, but there are a variety of what are called constraint qualifications that basically are conditions on the constraints that are sufficient to guarantee strong duality. So the simplest of these, and probably the most widely applicable, is called Slater's condition. And this basically says that either the constraints GM are affine inequality constraints, meaning that we can write them as AX less than or equal to B, or for the remaining constraints, that there's some X that is strictly feasible, meaning there's some X for which GM of X is strictly less than zero for the non-affine constraints. So actually proving that this condition implies strong duality is a little bit involved. We're not going to worry about this. And in all of the problems that we're going to encounter in this course, it turns out strong duality will hold. So these conditions are not extremely restrictive. Okay, so before we move on to finally talk about some actual algorithms for constrained optimization, I just want to talk a little bit more about the relationship between the primal and dual problems when we have strong duality. So we've already argued that if we have strong duality, then if x star is a solution to the primal problem and lambda star is a solution to the dual problem, then x star is also a minimizer of L of x lambda star, or said another way, the gradient of the Lagrangian evaluated at x star and lambda star is going to be equal to zero. Now, we can actually say a little bit more about x star and lambda star if we look back at our previous analysis. So in particular, in the final inequality in our chain of reasoning, we actually show that f of x star plus some of lambda m star gm of x star is actually equal to f of x star. So this actually tells us that this entire sum is equal to zero. And since each term in the sum has to be less than or equal to zero, the only way this sum can be equal to zero is if each product inside of this sum is itself equal to zero. Now, if we combine these two facts with the fact that x star and lambda star must be feasible in order to be solutions to the primal and dual problems, then we arrive at a set of conditions that solutions x star and lambda star to the primal and dual problems have to satisfy. These are known as the KKT conditions after Karush, Kuhn, and Tucker, who first formulated them. So we've already shown that when strong duality holds, if x star and lambda star are solutions to the primal and dual problems, then they satisfy the KKT conditions. It's also the case that if you can find any x star and lambda star that obey the KKT conditions, then you actually necessarily have strong duality. And that guarantees that x star and lambda star will be primal and dual optimal. We proved this in the notes. It's not very hard. But the bottom line is that these KKT conditions actually are not only useful in von understanding these theoretical properties, but they come up in practical algorithms. As I'll talk about in a moment, and as you'll see in the homework, there are a lot of algorithms that actually explicitly try to find x star and lambda star that satisfy these kinds of conditions. But also the KKT conditions allow us to sometimes easily translate a solution to the primal problem into a solution for the dual, or a solution for the dual into a solution for the primal. And this can be super useful. So you'll see a very very notable example of this, the derivation of the support vector machine in the homework. And this can be super useful because sometimes the dual problem is much easier to solve than the primal or reveals some structure that's not very obvious when you just look at the primal. Okay, so I'd like to close by talking about 
just at a high level, some of the common algorithms that are used to solve constrained optimization problems. I'll talk about a few different approaches. What they all kind of share is that ultimately what they're trying to do is just to replace the constrained program that we want to solve with some unconstrained problem or a series of unconstrained problems that allow us to get at what this solution looks like. Okay, so the first approach I want to mention, it's not really so much an algorithm as just a trick that is is very often useful that lets us avoid even thinking about constraints. So programs with linear equality constraints can basically always be written as optimization problems that don't have linear equality constraints. If our only constraints are these linear equality constraints, then we can convert this to an unconstrained problem. So just to be very clear about this, suppose we want to solve the problem where we want to minimize over x and rn f of x, subject to the constraint ax equals b. So suppose that x naught is just some point satisfying ax naught equals b. This might not be the solution to our optimization problem, it's just some x naught that satisfies this constraint. Then any possible feasible x can be decomposed into x naught plus h, where h has to live in the null space of a. So just remember the null space of a is some linear subspace, has dimension k equals to n minus the rank of a, and we can form some basis for this space, we'll call it Q. And that means for any H in the null space of A, we can write H as Q times some vector W. So W really captures the only freedom we have in this problem. So for any H, we can just, rather than thinking about it as a search over H, we can think of it as a search over W. And that lets us just rewrite this problem as minimize over W and RK, F naught of X naught plus QW. And this is a simple unconstrained problem. So sometimes this method can be very helpful for avoiding to have to even think about all of the algorithms I'm gonna describe below. So the first real algorithm I wanna talk about for constrained optimization is what are called barrier methods. All right, so let's recall our standard constrained optimization problem where we want to minimize over X and Rn F of X subject to the constraints GM of X is less than or equal to zero for M from one to capital M. And recall before that we argued that for the appropriate choice of lambda, this is equivalent to solving minimize over x, f of x plus the sum of lambda m gm of x. And the challenge here was that we had to figure out how to set lambda, which actually required solving yet another constrained optimization problem, which we don't really want to do right now. So an alternative approach is instead of bringing our constraints into the objective function through a linear term, instead we can consider embedding these constraints inside of some barrier function b. So instead we're going to say let's minimize over x f of x plus the sum of b of gm of x. The idea here is that we want to choose this barrier function b so that when g of x satisfies our constraints, so when g of x is negative, b of g of x is small, so we don't have much of an effect on the optimization problem. But when g of x is greater than or equal to zero, we want b of g of x to be large so that we bias our solutions away from x that violate our constraints. So the ideal solution here would be to set b to be the indicator function. So say b of x is actually equal to zero if x is less than or equal to zero, and infinity if x is greater than zero. So in this case, this unconstrained problem will be equivalent to the constrained problem, but b is not smooth. So this is not a very friendly optimization problem to solve. So most barrier methods try to use some other b that kind of approximates this, but while being smooth, so we can use standard algorithms like gradient descent or Newton's method. The most common choice here is that we take b of x to be minus one over tau times the log of minus x, where tau is some constant that we can tune. So this is the log barrier function. And so these are usually called log barrier methods. Now, when we do this, we're actually solving an approximation to the original problem. But actually using the KKT conditions, you can get strong bounds on how close the solution of the log barrier approach is to the optimal value of the original problem. So in particular, if x star of tau denotes the solution to our optimization problem using tau in this log, barrier function, then f of x star of tau minus f star is upper bounded by m over tau. So this gets us within m over tau of the optimal value of our original objective function, where m is the number of constraints. So this 
sort of suggests that you want to set tau to be very large. The problem is that this also makes the problem harder to solve. You're getting sort of less and less smooth as you increase tau. And so what is more common in practice is to consider a sequence of problems where we start with tau being relatively small, having a very easy unconstrained problem. And then at each iteration, we multiply tau by some constant, say 10, and further refine our solution at, at each iteration. This is a very simple and powerful method to use, especially if the problem is small enough that you can do something like use Newton's method. Okay, another approach to constrained optimization that can sometimes be particularly effective is just a very simple modification of standard gradient descent. So suppose that we had basically just ignored the constraints in our optimization problem. So recall that the you know, core iteration of gradient descent is to just take xk plus 1 to be equal to xk minus alpha k times the gradient of f evaluated at xk. And the problem with this approach is that even if we start with xk that satisfies our constraints, the update can easily lead to an xk plus 1 that violates our constraints. So we can fix this by just requiring that after each gradient descent step, we actually reinforce the constraints by projecting onto the constraint set. So formally, if C is the set of X such that GM of X is less than or equal to zero for all M, then we can define this projection of X onto C, PC, of x as just the argmen of all z and c, so the z in this constraint set c that minimizes the two norm of x minus z. Or in other words, pc of x is just the closest element in c to this x. And with that notation, we can just write the projected gradient descent iteration as saying that xk plus 1 is going to be the projection onto c of xk minus alpha k times the gradient of f evaluated xk. So this is just a standard gradient step, but then we reproject on the constraint set at each iteration. This is a very simple, but often very effective method for solving constraint optimization problems when we can efficiently solve this projection problem. So this isn't always the case, but very often we can actually just analytically write down this solution to this projection problem. So I want to close just by talking about one more class of algorithms that make a slightly more explicit connection to the notions from Lagrangian duality that we described before. So at a high level, what a lot of what are called primal dual methods do is iteratively optimizing over both x and lambda, where we alternately hold x fixed and update lambda, and then hold lambda fixed and update x. There are actually many different primal dual methods that kind of fit into this alternating update strategy. But just to give you a flavor of what these might look like, recall the Lagrangian function and that we can recover a primal optimal solution by minimizing Lagrangian when we found lambda star. And we can recover a dual optimization lambda star by maximizing the Lagrangian when we have x star. And so one primal dual method that exploits this is to alternately solve these minimization and maximization problems to try to find the x star and lambda star that respectively minimize and maximize this Lagrangian function. So the idea here is very simple. So suppose we fix the dual variables lambda k and we then minimize the Lagrangian with respect to x to get our estimate xk plus 1. Now we've got an updated xk plus 1. Let's maximize the Lagrangian at xk plus 1 with respect to lambda to get our lambda of k plus 1. And then we just repeat this iteration until we get convergence. Now there's, this is just one primal dual approach, but there are many, many variants that extend this approach that exploit different kinds of structure in the problem, which can sometimes make one or the other of these minimizations much easier or harder, or they use some other kind of update rules for the primal or dual variables, depending on the details of the problem that we're looking at. You'll get some brief and brief flavor of this in the homework, but there's a lot more that we're just not going to explore in this class. Next time, we'll turn to talking a little bit more about some applications where these kinds of constrained optimization problems arise.